What's going on, Dan K Show fans? It's another week and another bunch of hockey to talk about. Things happening all over the country, and one team still remains unbeaten. Find out who it is and find out who we need to talk about this week on the Dan K Show. All right, Dan K Show fans, let's get down to it. Time for Dan K's three things. Thing number one, Lucas, there is a new number one at the helm here of the USPHL, and we are really, really excited to talk about it today and to interview him soon. Bob Turo, the new commissioner of the USPHL, announced this past week exciting, exciting news. A lot to talk about there, an incredible hockey mind and business mind taking over the helm. Thing number two, thing number two, Lucas J. Bump. The Lucas J. Bump. I've always heard of the Dan K. Bump, but apparently the Toledo Cherokee got the Lucas J. Bump. And Lucas, I'm already gassing up the car. We got the offer to come out and do a game in Toledo. We're going. Toledo Cherokee, Metro Jets. We recap a thriller in Manila with those two squads. Thing number three, Man, oh, man. It's just good to see hockey back. You know, we're getting into it. It's getting a little chillier outside. I was walking around outside this morning. I had that crisp air, that that feeling of hockey, that feeling of puck drop, that feeling of Dan K. Show time, because this is where we thrive, Lucas. It's hockey time yet again. And with that, I introduce him to the show, my left-hand man. Mike Consigliere, the head of academics on the Dan K Show, um, the only reason why I passed my high school French class, uh, a guy who, you know, he, he gets it. He gets it, both uh, on the cuisine side, on the, on the brewery side. On the, he, he gets it. You know, he knows all things. A master of all things, Lucas Jones, welcome to the show. Bonjour, Daniel. Ça va? Uh, ça va bien. Uh, that's it, though. I'm going to stop speaking <laughs> French right there. That's it. We've hit the we've hit the limit on on that. But I, I'm happy to be here, Dan. What a week in the USPHL it has been. You know, not only did we have a clash of some unbeaten teams, but we've still got a few unbeaten squads scattered throughout the league. We've got two in the Great Lakes, one in the Mid Atlantic, and then that uh, that Pacific Division finally got its start here. We've got two unbeaten teams out there. Las Vegas Thunderbirds and the Fresno Monsters. What a huge, huge weekend it was throughout the league. Really huge. And, I mean, the biggest news has to be a new commissioner at the helm here. And this is such a great ad. I mean, you talk about, first of all, we, I should be learning more French because this is – Bob Turo has – he has dual citizenship in Canada and the U.S. So I'm going to have to learn my French a little better here and get a little – because right now I got, like, just sweet fromage, which is not a real sentence. It doesn't work. <laughs> Or if I wanted some candy, I could ask you for du bon bon pour moi. But other than that, like that, you look at this ad, Lucas, and what what a hire for the USPHL. This is a league that has already been ascending over the last two years. They got in a rocket ship this summer and took it to the next stratosphere, just absolutely blowing by competitors with the 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 style of playing the ice, the ability to grow the product off the ice, the player development, the the keen eye of understanding how to limit travel time so you mm-hmm. can be on the ice more and in the bus less. They've done it all right. Now this ad, I mean, I am so excited to talk to the commission. Yeah, this is going to be a really fun interview. We've been looking forward to it ever since the news was announced. You know, bringing in, bringing in new skills, right? That's, that's all it, and that's what it comes down to. And, and this commissioner is bringing with him a unique set of skills that will help him continue the ascent of the USPHL. Yeah, and I mean, the background with the USHL putting together some – you look at the, the prospects that he has had an effect on. Joe Thornton, Rick DiPietro, Sidney – and Rick DiPietro, it's a guy, you know, we're going after his job, Lucas. You know, we, he's, in the, he's in the talking agents now. Sid the Kid, Eric Johnson, Patty Kane, Steven Stamkos, John Tavares, Taylor Hall. You, you, this guy has had an effect on so many incredible hockey careers mm-hmm. with the work he does – and the biggest thing is he cares. 
He cares about the game. And that's, that's what you see from all through. You talk about like Dave Peters with the NCDC, the NCDC's commissioner. There is an innate understanding, just an, an unmatched understanding of the player experience for everyone that is a part of this league at the executive level. And that is what they do so well. And that is where, where the success has come from. Yeah. And, and like I said, I think this is going to be really, really good for the USPHL. You're adding that, that development lineage. You're bringing in, uh, you're bringing in some, some insights, right? Some new perspectives. Every person's got a different viewpoint on things, right? Every person sees the same item through a different lens. And so you, you increase the number of lenses, you increase the amount of dialogue going on between, you know, the league office and the various parts of the USPHL and you and I as well, as, as you increase those perspectives, you increase that dialogue only good things can happen hey i'm always looking for a new place to get my hair cut too and he's got ties to the fantastic sam salon franchise there maybe a little dan k show move you know we were talking <laughs> to, to some hairspray companies i almost said names at one point so who knows who knows maybe we'll get my hair cut there but seriously lucas this is this is exciting times you know anytime you bring in another great mind into the game it, it, it just it does nothing but good. It, it, it does nothing but grow the game more, grow what the league is doing more. This is the biggest league in the country, and they got one of the biggest names now at the helm. Big, big days ahead. Yeah, we are. We are absolutely looking forward to that interview. Make sure you stay tuned to social media. We'll be announcing details of that and when it'll be released. That is correct. And with that, we got to take a turn here, Lucas. Are we taking a break before this turn? Because I need to know how to throw to it because I'm so excited. We're going to, uh, we're going to go right into this one, Dan. Right into it, right into it. Okay. Got it. Got it. I'm going to take a deep breath. Calm down back there. Giant portrait of Dan. <sighs> okay. Toledo. Holy Toledo. The Toledo Cherokee are 12 and O, undefeated, unblemished, unbeaten, unstoppable. And they just beat the Metro Jets in an absolute thriller. Lucas, you interviewed Coach, and it, apparently you gave him the Lucas J. bump, which I will do some math for you real quick. You wanted to take credit for the Lucas J. bump. It does kind of come back to me and become a Dan K. bump, you know, because I didn't <laughs> talk to them. So it's kind of me because you did the interview. Yeah. Me not doing the interview and bringing up that they were undefeated, which I would have obviously done. Right. Might have been the reason. So you're welcome to the folks in Toledo. I will take the credit. So I, I thought of the interview, scheduled the interview, did the interview, edited the interview, posted the interview, still a Dan K. bump. Correct. I, I, as long as you get it. And you know, folks, this is why we work so well together. <laughs> <laughs> no, th but li literally, because I mean, you talk to coach, obviously, you got the rundown on how things are going out there in Toledo. And what a start to the season for them. It, you always, you, obviously, 10 and 0, there's no such thing as a 10 and 0 fluke, right? right? But coming into this weekend, you're sitting there going, really? Are they going to beat Metro? Is, like, Pittsburgh's got this lineage, too. They know how to win. And they go out there and they beat Metro Jets. That's not a statement. That is absolutely landing your spacecraft on the moon and planting the flag, man. That was a big one for Toledo. Yeah. I mean, this is, you don't, you don't want to overstate how big of a win this is in a couple of different aspects. You know, you, you see on the one hand, if you look at the shots in the game, Metro Jets jumped out to a 13-6 to shot lead in the first period, scoring their first goal was uh, Cody Maste. So you talk about a plus seven on the shot board, and you're up one goal going into the second. Then the Toledo Cherokee evened it up, Bryce Davis, and – they put some more shots on the board. Then Toledo puts 13 up on the board. Now the shots are a little more even. And so now you get yourself back in. You set yourself up for this phenomenal third period of play. Toledo scores first, Bailey Bird. And then in the waning minutes of the third period of play, Matt Cruz, his second goal of the season, sends it into overtime. And this overtime was a lot of fun to watch. Four shots per side, lots of even play. Toledo was able to get that goal. And I think – the, the one thing that I see, the one stat that I'm, I'm zeroed in on is that Metro Jets were 0 for 6 on the power play. Right now, what that means is they've started on the right track because they were almost even with Metro in terms of penalties but did not allow a single power play goal. They scored a power play goal on their end. So you, you, you 
talk about these uh, these sort of stereotypes, these cliches about having to be successful on the special teams. Well, that power play goal ends up almost winning them the game in some respects here, Dan. So I think it's not something to be overlooked. It's a headstrong Toledo team for sure. Yeah, and you want to look at why the penalty kill was so successful? Look no further than the net and in the crease. That was Marcelo D'Antonano. And this guy, year 01, he's 9-0 and this year, Lucas. He's 9-0 and between the pipes. He's got 204 saves, a 219 goals against, a very respectable 911 saves percentage. And you're going to be calling 911 if you got to play against this guy the rest of the year, man, because he doesn't give up easy goals. He doesn't give up those soft ones, right? He, he's, he's a mental player and he's a mental netminder. And I'll take a heady goaltender over a flashy one any day in net. You know, I love my forwards to be scorers, my wingers, my center. Get involved in a game. You know, be flashy. Yeah, that's what I talk about Mike Stanway all the time in the New York Aviators. I love getting out there and scoring. But when I talk about my netminder, man, do the job. Let's go. Post to post. Make stops. Get the puck out of the way there. Cover it up when you need to. Don't take chances. Give my team a chance to play. Be my sixth skater there on the defensive end and stop everything you need to stop. And Marcelo is doing that in bunches. Nine and O. Oh, he gets the big OT win against the Metro Jets. Bounces back from that late game tying goal for Matt Cruz, the Cruz missile man, who was one of the fastest skaters in the game. Mm -hmm. And what a huge win for Toledo. I mean, what's the locker room like after that? I can't imagine. That had to be one great place to be. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be a, a confidence booster on their end. You know, you it's got to be great for them going into our power rankings coming up at the end of the month as well. And I think one of the, the greatest things about this is, you know, to get back to that power play goal, you don't score that power play goal. All of a sudden, that Matt Cruz tying goal becomes a Matt Cruz game winning goal. Yep. And it, it gives you such a different landscape. And Toledo was able to put up three goals on uh, Louis Pierre Fortier, who's up to this point been essentially a fort in front of the net. Four wins coming into this one with a 9.51 saves percentage and a 1.09 goals against average after giving up three goals to Toledo. So this is an impressive net minder in Fortier. And Toledo looked at that and they said, okay game on. Let's go. Let's see what we can throw up against this team, against this goalie. They played hard into the boards. They played hard at center ice. It's exactly what coach said they wanted to do. They locked it down on the discipline aspect of the game. This Toledo team is going to be tough this year. They've been built on the last couple of years, and now they're in a place where they're the talk of the town. Yeah, and you know what next week is, right? You know what next, uh, the next week is? Next week is we're in our last little run here to get yourself into those power rankings because mm -hmm. next week we're going to have a couple questions with the commish during our power rankings episode, Lucas, because that's what next week's all about. So you look at this Toledo, you want to talk about putting yourself in a good spot. They are in an incredible spot, but let's look at their next three games this weekend, Friday, 7 PM Eastern time. The Pittsburgh vengeance are coming to town in a battle of the top two teams in the Great Lakes. They got to play them Friday and Saturday. That is a, could be a trick, could be a treat for them, Lucas. Then what do you back that up to? You go through, you get through that weekend, Friday, November 6th, they open that thing up with the Metro Jets again. <laughs> well, oh. that's, that's the gauntlet, right? It's okay, Battle of the Unbeatens. How about the Battle of the Unbeatens two weeks in a row, right? How about being on top, tied for first, in first place, and having to play the other unbeaten teams in your division? Imagine now you split a one and one with Pittsburgh, and no one's unbeaten anymore, and everyone's got to wear that loss. I don't know. I, I think this, this might be an interesting weekend. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that the Toledo Cherokee will sweep, but I think it will be interesting, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Well, you look at it right now, Toledo has beaten Metro going into our power rankings episode. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh has every ability right now to not just take the top spot in the Great Lakes from them, but potentially the top spot in next week's power rankings, which would be the first time in vengeance history that they were in the top three. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. huge. Huge stuff right there. I'm excited. It's brought to you by Elite Junior Profiles. That's ElitejRProfiles.com. 
power rankings we can coming up next week. But first, we got to talk a little bit more premier before this thing's all over. It was a light week on the schedule for the NCDC, so we stay premier. We stick with it. And, Lucas, I think we're going to talk a little mid-Atlantic and maybe about the openings out there in the West. You are watching the Dan K Show. Everything USPHL, from the NCDC to the Premier and Elite Leagues. The Dan K Show with Dan K and Lucas Jones. All right, hockey fans, welcome back. It's time to dig a little bit deeper into the Premier here. And first we start, go West, young man, is what they said. And we're going to go West here, all the way West to the Pacific division man and the pacific coast highway could not hold in all the excitement out here in the hockey world aka dan k with the terrible terrible west coast like word usage there i'm sorry to everybody out there i'm trying to get to know y'all okay <laughs> i know i got family out there i know everyone talks about the highways in california i know vegas has a lot of fun times i know i know southern oregon man the beautiful beautiful scenery out there Anaheim, San Diego. I mean, could you get better with the weather? So let's talk, though, hockey out here in the West. And, Lucas, Las Vegas and Fresno looking like forces to be reckoned with early this season. Absolutely. Las Vegas Thunderbirds, 17 players with a point in their opening weekend. You're talking three games, 22 goals for, five goals against, a 17-goal differential. Their differential alone is more goals than some teams score in three, four, five games. So you talk about an explosive team, a team that's, that's sort of flying high here. The Thunderbirds really showed up this opening weekend. And the Fresno Monsters did as well, taking two against the San Diego Sabres with an eight-goal differential, scoring 14 goals in that one. Las Vegas and Fresno, you don't want to make too many opening weekend predictions because this is the first time out. That first week's always a little iffy. Goalies are a little jumpy. Defensemen are back skating quite as quick as they should be. But, you know, in typical Dan K show form, if we wanted to take this and just run with it, the Las yep. Vegas Thunderbirds and the Fresno Monsters, they look to be dominant. Although the San Diego Sabres and the Anaheim Avalanche, Dan, they've got a lot of potential and a lot of great skaters in their ranks. I, yeah, I mean, great places to play the game of hockey, right? Southern California, there weather-wise, it's perfect. And But you look in net, and a guy who was close to perfect this weekend for the Las Vegas Thunderbirds was Anthony Binaldi. 2-0 and in the three games. His, his counterpart, Colin Gallimore, there also with a win on the weekend. But this guy saw 86 shots in two games. I mean, this is not a low shot total to put up a 203 goals against and a 953 saves percentage. He mm -hmm. only allowed four of those 86 past him. What a weekend to start. I mean, goaltending, a lot of times you don't see a live action. You don't see a live game. It's a lot easier to get work in as a forward or defenseman when you can't get on the ice. And Bonaldi gets right after it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and establishing himself as one of the premier players on that squad as well. And I did want to spend a, a minute going through the San Diego Sabres as well. You know, obviously going 0-2 in that opening weekend. But let's talk the top two skaters on San Diego for a second. Tyler McCullough, four goals, no assists. That's an easy one. The math is easy on that. Four points. He's a 2,000. But their second scorer, another centerman, an 3 Vladislav Sohudalov. And I hope I got that one correct because I really <laughs> just dove in and went for that last name. But these two skaters are, you know, at the first two games have set themselves up as this high-scoring, high-energy duo responsible for eight points between the two of them, six goals, two assists. And that's why I'm confident in the San Diego Sabres, uh, you know, to move past this opening weekend, to get some momentum. We saw what happened in the Mountain Division. You struggle in that first weekend. You find your skates. You get them underneath you. I'm excited to continue to watch where San Diego goes. Yeah, and I mean, you look at this Fresno squad. I want to look at some of their scores. And one, one I got to point out here. How about Cade Moxham? Okay, and this guy's got moxie. He's a year 04. He's a year 04. I, I think I'm 100. <laughs> I, I mean, everything. My back hurts thinking about that. My knees. But Cade, man, this guy was so good. A three-goal opening weekend. Had one on the power play. You look at Jacob Gagnon there. Gagnon with the, the three-goal, eight-assist, three-game start out here. Two power play goals for him. There's so much talent out in this Pacific division this year. I can't wait to see them kind of 
eventually everyone's going to get together here and play nationals time. I'm excited for what this Pacific division has to offer. Yeah, and, and sort of wrapping things out with the Anaheim Avalanche, this is an older team, a lot of veterans, a lot of guys who have experience with the game. That should give you confidence if you're an Anaheim Avalanche fan that this team is going to find it. They're going to get it moving in the right direction. Charles Reardon, Riley Cryan, and Liam Massey leading this, this squad early on this season in points. But when you see those veterans, when you see the guys that have the experience, that gives you the confidence to say that this team, this 0-3 weekend, not representative of where they're going to be in a couple weeks. Yeah, and then we jump over to the Mid-Atlantic now, right? So you go West Coast, East Coast there. And for everyone who thinks there's an, an East Coast bias, that's why we put the West Coast first, Lucas, right? You know, they say West Coast, best coast. It's East Coast, Beast Coast. We just like to stand in the middle and enjoy it. You ever heard that? Never heard that one. <laughs> Never heard that. That's it. They got shirts. People make shirts. But we keep going. I mean, you look at this Mid-Atlantic division, 10 teams in it this year. So a lot of competition. The first place I got to start, I'm going to, I'm going to go, well, good news, bad news. Let's go this good news, bad news, Lucas. What would you like first? Uh, I'd like the bad news first. Okay. So I, what I look at here at number eight is a two and three aviator squad. Okay. The record doesn't worry me five games into the season. It never worries me. But what do we know about this team? They lost more points in this off season than some teams as a whole had all of last season mm -hmm. because of this offensive style, because of how different what Mike Stanaway does is 11 goals for in their first five games only. I mean, they score 11 in a game a couple times a year, this aviator side with the way they play the game of hockey. Yep. How worried are you with the aviators right now? With 10 teams in the mid Atlantic, let's do scale of one to 10. You're worried. 10 being most worried, one being least worried. I, I'm at a three with this New York Aviators team. I, I am not concerned at all. You talk about a team that's two and three, and you see a goal differential of minus four. 11 goals for, 15 goals against. I'm not concerned in the slightest because the defensive effort is right where it was for the majority of last season, right? The Aviators like to play this, this you know, down ice skating. They love to pin the puck in the offensive zone. They like to get their guys out and get them skating, get them running forward. So you talk about having to replace the amount of points. Mike Stanaway said they had to replace three, 350 points on the roster from last season. The offense will find its way forward. The offense is going to get there once that team gels. Once you start getting those guys skating out, skating out of the zone, picking off the puck in the middle of the ice and, and you know, dumping and chasing and finding those weak spots – the offense will get there. The defense doesn't even worry me. You know, you, you talk about five games, giving up 15 goals. It's three goals a game. That's perfectly serviceable. And yep. especially with the way the aviators play offense, that just tells me the defense is fine. The offense will get there. I put it at a one. And I tell you that because a lot of what you're saying here, they're getting the defensive effort, right? Mm -hmm. So Mike Stanaway is always going to figure out a way to put the puck in the back of the net. It, it, it may last a little bit, just trying to figure it out, getting the ice time under the guy's skates. It was a later start this year for the Aviators. Brand new roster almost. I mean, and that's what happens when you do things right. Guys go to the next level. You know, guys, guys get to that point. They get picked up by schools. You saw three different Aviator star, stars all signing on just this past week. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing it right, you have to rebuild each year you know and that's what you're seeing right now i'm excited to see where they go a lot of games in hand to get back into it but a team who doesn't need any games in hand right now is an 8 0 and 2 philadelphia hockey club side with 18 points at the top of this division 68 goals for just 20 against they got off the season real fast a real hot start against pal and they've given everybody they face trouble yeah, they're a tough team. I mean, you, you talk about 68 goals scored in 10 games. That's insane. You're nearly approaching seven goals a game. How, how is any team supposed to outscore that, right? And, and you, you look at a team that can play offense like that, and you start to wonder where that 20 goals against is even coming from, right? So with an offense that dominant, it's easy to continuously play defense by the fact that you're just controlling the puck. So I think you have to look at this Philadelphia hockey club team and say, okay, well, how do you beat this team? Well, you, you got to hit them. You got to hit them, you know, in, in sort of the weak spots. You got to 
stop them from carrying the puck over the blue line. You got to fight for the boards and they try to dump and chase. You have to use the boards to try to escape, get that passing up the sides of the ice. This is a team that wants to control the puck, control the middle and control the pace of the game. So you just have to lock that thing down, right? You talk about something, you know, for a lot of football fans in the middle of football season, right? When you get a team that loves to air the football, when you get a team that loves to play offense, what do you do? You Lucas Jones them. You put that ball on the ground and you give it to the running back and you control that clock. Don't even let the other team get on the offensive side of the ice. I'm interested to see how Philadelphia Hockey Club would respond to a team that's able to successfully do that to them, almost like a Richmond General style. When, you know, when the Richmond Generals get to that one goal, two goal lead, they just turtle and they control the middle of the ice. So I'd be interested to see what happens uh, or if that is even possible to play against a team like the Philadelphia Hockey Club. So you, you mentioned what you do to a team that likes to air the football out. What do you do with a team that likes to deflate it? Uh, you suspend them for four games and then don't offer up any more punishment. Hey, don't break your phones, New England Patriots fans, all right? I'm just joking. Let's not break our phones out there. So, but I keep moving here. I go, to the, I go to Elmira, to the Elmira Junior Enforcers. The brand-new squad out here, new coach behind the bench, new setup. We got a chance to talk to them when they're recruiting early in the year. They start mm-hmm. off 4-2-2, two, and two, a great start for Elmira here, sitting in a, in a playoff positioning right now early in the season. Kevin Martin, four goals, three assists. Ben Sarbaugh. Four goals, two assists. Jack Rogers, man, that guy sounds like he could be in like an old Western movie. <laughs> and he's, he's got three goals, three assists. Then you move to the goaltender side. This is what I really like to see. Yeah. Four starts apiece, balance in net. Grant Linville, Joseph Weiss, each of them with two wins under their belts. A two goals against average for Linville, a 2.51 for Weiss. I mean, overall, they're almost the same guy in net. When you have a two-headed monster at this level, it's so important. Yeah, that's, you know, we say it every year, but we say it because it's true. You have to have two goaltenders to carry you through the season, and you need, absolutely need two goaltenders to get you through to Nationals because they have to be able to rotate in and out. Both goaltenders have to be at the same level. Like you said, Dan, these guys are almost carbon copies of each other. You're talking about a 2-5 and under goals against average, uh, 9-2-5 and 9-3-5 save percentage, equal minutes, you know, as long as these guys get some support from their defense. And I think we're seeing that we're seeing the support from the defense. We're seeing the offense, not afraid to really take that puck and move it down the ice. These two goaltenders are going to be the backbone of this Elmira team. Really the only one on the stat sheet you have to worry about is some goaltender named empty net. Who's given up 240 (laughs) goals a game, Dan, you you can't allow that. You can't allow that. But I mean, empty net might get cut, you know, he might get cut. You might have to. You talk about goaltenders you can build a team around. Let's go to the Rockets Hockey Club in this division, sitting in second place right now with Joe Hughes. This man is the Willy Wonka of goaltenders. You get nothing, you lose. Good day, sir. He's got a 1.80 goals against, a 9-1-0 saves. He's right back onto his winning ways, 3-1-0 to start the season. I love Joe Hughes, man. And this is a guy who's a steadying force and come playoff time, he's going to play a ginormous humongous role you know we got to watch joe hughes last year in a great game against the charleston colonials where he lost by giving up the first goal of the game uh and so you know joe is an incredible goaltender extremely disciplined uh very headstrong you know we talked to him a little bit in the off season as well and just a guy who's always putting the work in so it's no surprise to see that he's succeeding in the premiere and he's really getting thrown in the grinder here because of how good the Mid-Atlantic has been, even in the first two months of the season, right? Last year, it took the Mid-Atlantic really till about Christmas or New Year's to really establish themselves as a dominant force. They're getting after it early this year. A lot of really good teams. Joe Hughes with the sub two goals against, nine ten saves percentage. This is a goaltender along with Nolan Woodring, who two rookies back-to-back here, making things happen for the Rockets. Yeah, and you look at the Skipjacks and Connecticut Junior Rangers. These are two teams right in it, right at that 500 area there in terms of win percentage. Good amount of games under their belts. The Skipjacks just got one against a tough aviator squad. Mm -hmm. These are two. Watch out for the Mid-Atlantic, because here's what I'll tell you, folks. The last two years, it's been the same thing. There's always one slow starter who hits an absolute torrid streak and runs back up. Will it be the Aviators? Will it be the Skipjacks? Will it be the Connecticut Junior Rangers? Will it be the Hitmen? Will it be the Buffalo Thunder, the Utica Junior Comets, pal? Who knows? You're going to have to watch to find out. 
And what you also have to watch to you USPHL Midwest fans out there wondering, why have we not talked about the Midwest West yet this week? Guess what? We did. Yesterday. Audio podcast. Go back and check it out. Check out the Dan K Show Presents Junior Hockey as we talk all things USPHL Midwest West Showcase. Dan K, Lucas Jones, that's a good one. Really good advice in that one for hockey players at home as well. With that, my advice to you folks is to take a deep breath because the net miners leaving the net, and it's time for us to get to our favorite segment of the show, The Empty Net. Welcome to The Empty Net. Welcome to our favorite portion of each week's show, The Empty Net, where we talk to you, the fan, Dan K, Lucas Jones. And Lucas, we had a fun, fun week in hockey. We talked about the USPHL Midwest West in our audio podcast that you should be going to listen to if you haven't already after this. But we got some awesome tweets because the Minnesota Moose beat just about every team in the Midwest in overtime this weekend, Lucas. What an incredible weekend. And Uncle Turk, at Uncle underscore Turk, our buddy out there in the Midwest, said, I'm targeting getting hair color for all the gray hairs I'm getting from these OT games. And he said, <laughs> Ooh, duh. hashtag roll moose, hashtag comeback kids. And that's, he sent the, uh, the Tim Allen in Santa Claus look right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I've been, I, I get gray hairs from watching these games and I'm just, I'm just the national USPHL guy. I'm not, I'm not uh, like a home moose fan here. I can't nope. imagine what it's like for moose country watching these games Someone's got to tell them that they don't get more points for winning games in overtime here, Dan. We, they, they, they still get the normal amount of points. There's no need to make your fans this nervous. And then also some awesome stuff sent in from Seth Kotler's ma to the old USPHL network page. Remember, if you're following the USPHL network page, go to the Dan K Show because we are the USPHL network. The Dan K Show that's where you'll want to go, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the underscore Dan K Show, www.dankshow.com. Great places to come find us, but we, we do go out of our way to find you at times, but an awesome job there, Lucas. And at the end of that game, some great sharing of camaraderie there, a nice circle up with the boys at the end of it, and a great showing of character and just, you know, togetherness. Two organizations between the Colonials and the Eels that really respect one another, which is awesome to see. Yeah, I mean, you know, saying that it's been a tough year has been an under, is an understatement. Uh, so, you know, these boys getting out there on the ice, being able to show that support, and, and I think that mutual respect, right? For 60 minutes, your enemies, but outside of that, these guys were all friends, and I think it's important uh, for that to, that to be out there, and glad to see that these two teams were able to come together. Love it, love it, love it. Finally, Awesome pictures from Chris Farley, father of Noah Farley and Andrew Farley he sent us the pictures of Noah in the booth making his debut on the mic. And what a job done by Noah again. I know we talked about it last week, but the pictures were awesome. Great to see him getting to work out there. And possibly, you know, his kid could have a new career here. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, Noah, I've got a headset with your name on it. When when you guys come out to, you know, up to the East Coast for a showcase or two, or when we inevitably get down to Richmond. You guys are getting on the broadcast. We'll, we'll do our little rotating circle of on-ice reporting, and uh, it should be a fun one. Oh, definitely fun. We thank everyone for watching. Lucas, your parting words for this week. Great job. Great work. When Dan Kay's on a mic, it is always hockey night. We thank everyone for watching. Stay safe. Keep wearing your mask. Stay distanced. Do everything you can to keep yourself safe, healthy, and happy as we make our way through this season. You know, there's only a few weeks left in 2020 now. Don't even look at it as months, everybody. We're almost, we're getting there. We're pushing through it. Let's work together and let's play some hockey. All right. Nailed Great it. job. We did it. That's it. What do you think, big portrait of Dan in the back? 